Our next speaker is Dr. Nina Sho, who's the Executive Director of the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. Nina, uh, she's studied loons in New York's Adirondack Park since 1998. She has a veterinary degree from the Virginia, Maryland Regional Colony of Veterinary Medicine, a master's degree in natural resource wildlife management from Humboldt State University, and a bachelor's degree in biology, behavioral ecology from Cornell University. Nina. I've known Nina uh, through the internet and phone for years, but this is the first time we've ever had a chance to meet. So it's a great pleasure for us. All right, let's see if I can get all the technology figured out. Um, as John said, it's, well, it's just a great pleasure to be here. This has been a really informative conference meeting uh, and I'm very honored to be part of it. So thank you for including me. And as John said, I've been studying loons uh, since 1998. It's now evolved into our own nonprofit, which is the Adirondack Center for Loon Conservation. And we're dedicated to, you need me? No. No. This one's not working. No, that one's to the room, this one's to the stream. Oh, okay. Lovely. <laughs> okay, so, and we do this through scientific research and education programs, so a variety of different things. And um, we evolved from some research that a group called Biodiversity Research Institute did uh, between 1998 and 2000 in the park, and then it, it expanded from there and, and started doing education programs. So we're studying loons for a variety of reasons. First off, they're one of the top predators in aquatic ecosystems in the freshwater, and also um, not quite as high in the in the uh, coastal waters, but uh, they uh, are definitely are a fish-eating bird that eats other fish and so on, um, that eat invertebrates down the food web. And they're also, in the breeding season, they're very territorial to keep other birds away from their nesting sites. Uh, and they live 20 to 30 years. So some of the birds that we started banding in 1998 and 99, we are still studying to this day. Uh, or at least we were last summer. I don't know if they'll come back this summer or not. And so all those factors, uh, characteristics, make them a great biological indicator of the lakes and ponds where they live, and in this case up here, the St. Lawrence River, and also the coastal waterways in the winter. In New York, there are species of special concern. They aren't endangered, they aren't threatened, but DEC does want to keep an eye on their population, and so our work is helping them do that. They're also um, a symbol of wilderness. People really like loons. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, they're, they're these black and white boring birds, you know? <laughs> but um, they, the, people love them. And it's a great way to talk to people about environmental conservation and threats that are affecting the, the environment. Um, speaking of which, there are a lot of different threats that affect loons in their habitats. And if you look at this list, the common thread here is humans. Even with wildlife predators, where there's more humans, there's more garbage, and uh, more opportunistic predators, things like bears and raccoons and so on, um, ravens and such. And so if we can decrease our impact on the environment, we're going to help loons and also the habitats where they live and all the animals and other things that live in those ecosystems. So this is a map of um, the range of common loons historically, which is here and here and even down into Pennsylvania at one point. Um, and then it has, it has gradually retracted for the most part uh, and significantly retracted back in the 60s and 70s, and that was probably primarily due to DDT. Uh, and since the 70s, in New York State at least, and actually throughout the Northeast, we've seen an expansion of the loon population. Um, in, in the mid-70s, DEC was estimating the population at 100 to 150 pairs, adult pairs. Um, 
And then in the 80s, they were saying 200 to 500 breeding pairs, maybe 1,000 birds. And now we're estimating about 2,000 adult birds that are breeding, actively breeding in the park. Um, but, you know, we started doing this study in 98 to look at the impact of mercury pollution and acid deposition on the Adir Adirondack loon population and use them as an indicator of what's going on in the aquatic ecosystems in the park. But now we're concerned about many other threats, um, including climate change. And this is a map that uh, is part of Audubon's um, survival by degrees. If you go to their website, you can uh, search for many different species of birds. And so this is looking at the impact of climate change on, on the loon population in, in North America. Um, whoops. Uh, let me just go back. So this is the current status of the birds. If there was no change, you would still see this population. Um, and with 1.5 degrees Celsius, you would see the population starting to retract here, going further north, still breeding quite successfully up really high north. And then at 2 degrees Celsius, it's really starting to retract quite a bit, and probably almost all the breeding birds in uh, northern United States would be um, not there anymore. You get to three degrees Celsius of temperature rise, and even into um, mid-Canada, the breeding birds are gone. So that's pretty significant. Um, and we are seeing increases in temperature rise throughout the Adirondacks. And um, so I thought I'd talk to you about some of the changes that we're seeing in the loon population over the years. And, and some of this is just because um, we've been studying the birds so long that we've, I've been able to analyze some of the data and, and get some of the information. So one characteristic of loons is that in the fall, they mold out their body plumage um, from black and white, and they keep their, their wing plumage. And uh, then they fly to the coast. I don't have a flight bird. Um, uh, a winter plumage bird, but, and this is their, where their migratory pathways are. Um, it's interesting that in Saskatchewan, some of the birds go down this way, and there's actually another set of birds that go a three-week, 3,000-mile migration down to the, um, the Gulf of Mexico. A friend of mine has done some satellite tracking of the birds here, and they went up there and met these birds, same lakes even, and that were migrating down this way, and then uh, went back down there over the winter. Our birds in, in northern New York, um, we have tracked them mostly between Cape Cod and uh, North Carolina, uh, but primarily through Cape Cod and New Jersey. And then they winter along the coasts, um, and the main birds, for example, just go straight off to the main coast, and as I mentioned, our birds in the, in the Adirondacks and St. Lawrence go this way, and go down up to about there. Um, the Great Lakes birds, they, and Canadian birds, um, they can go all up and down the east coast, and as I mentioned, the further north birds will go all the way down here. Uh, and further west, the Pacific loons and the common loons and red-throated loons mi uh, migrate along the western coast there. So in late fall, I'm sorry, late winter, um, they will actually do another molt, and they'll completely lose their flight feathers. This bird is starting to regrow its flight feathers, but um, they, they will be completely gone for about a month until the bird starts to regrow the feathers. And this has significant impacts for the loon population. Um, so Lake Champlain, as you know, is right here. And if you look at the ice in dates for Lake Champlain, uh, I did a 100-year period here, uh, it has gradually increased, um, gotten later and later. So, and actually this year so far, the lake has not iced over completely at all. Um, and there are still, a friend of mine saw seven loons out on, on the lake the other day. So, uh, used to be it, back in the early, in the 1800s, um, it would be iced in completely by the end of uh, January, beginning of February. And now, 
uh, it's more like mid-February. And <laughs> this year, like I said, I don't know if it'll ice in at all. Um, so it's been pretty interesting seeing how the change there can impact an individual bird. So this is an example of, um, we compiled some data between New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York for uh, about a 10-year period. And the winter rescues increased dramatically, especially in 2016. We had an, a huge number of birds that were rescued that year um, for us. And uh, that was primarily because um, we had a sudden ice in that winter where it, it wasn't icing up at all through December and then all of a sudden overnight it went from maybe 20 degrees to 10, 15 below and a lot of lakes iced at once. And some of the birds, this is an example of one of them, had lost their flight feathers and were unable to fly, so they were stuck. Um, and here's another example of a different bird. If they come down in a bad storm, then they uh, may be blown down, and that's why I call them road ice landers. Um, <laughs> and then here's an example of a bird that had a fishing lure caught in its wing, and we tried numerous times that fall to catch it, and the bird wanted nothing to do with us. So we're like, we're just going to wait until it ices up. And sure enough, that same week that we caught this bird, we caught that bird too. Um, so we have different rescue techniques for summer versus winter. Here's an example of a bird uh, right there, and two people, um, ice rescuers, going out to get it. And uh, <laughs> the ice fisherman was wondering what was going on, and this guy, one of uh, a retired forest ranger that has dealt with many, many people asking silly questions, said, well, if you toss out corn, the pike come up. <laughs> walleye come up. So they were catching walleye, according to that guy, and the fisherman said, oh, okay, and he turned away and walked away, and then um, you know, a half a minute later, that's what happened. They caught the bird. Um, and I put a band on that bird, and that bird uh, lived another nine months or so. It was, it was found, the band was found, um, deceased in, in uh, where was it? It was, I think it was in Lake George um, the following fall. So that was, that was nice. And that was actually a juvenile bird. A lot of the birds that, that ice in are juveniles because uh, the adults migrate in October, early November, and the juveniles don't know what they're supposed to do, and they hang out until they have to go. Um, and sometimes, like I said, they lose their flight feathers and they're caught. Other times, they just get iced in because it happens all of a sudden. Um, and so when we catch them, we do a little assessment on them, um, physical exam, and I always swim them for a little bit and see how they're swimming. So these are two birds um, that weren't doing very well. I don't know if you can see, but this bird has a wing tilt and a tail tilt. And uh, it was a list to the side. This is a red-throated loon in winter plumage. And that bird ended up having several fractures. I sent it over to Tufts Wildlife Clinic, and, and uh, they diagnosed it with several fractures. It had come down in a really bad storm. This one uh, had come down. This was a huge bird. It was a big male. And it came down in way below zero. Um, the day it came in, I had a juvenile come in that day that was in great condition, and I released it. And about 9 o'clock that night, from the very same area, a state trooper was knocking on my door with this bird, and that bird was not waterproof at all. It must have been down for a couple days. It was a big male. And, but he ended up getting released uh, after he waterproofed himself. So it took about a week. Um, and so sometimes... Um, Sometimes they get released. Uh, here's a red-throated loon, again, in winter plumage that came down. This is the bird that had the, uh, the, the missing wing feathers um, that got released. And then this is uh, five, two of the five loons that were found in a small puddle on Lake George one year um, that had iced in. And he met me at Westport with three of them, one of them, had, he had captured the day before, and it had passed away on the way to the vet clinic. The other one uh, had apparently gotten out and of the ice, of the, the puddle, and an eagle had taken away. But, so he caught the other three, and I met him at the Westport boat launch, and we put bands on them, and, and they actually did pretty well. I, I had to get a band return years later from one of them. So. Um, so there's a huge conservation benefit to rescuing loons 
because they are a, what's called a K-selected species. They are long-lived and they, they produce only a couple chicks a year. Um, and compared to something like a mallard that produces 10 to 12 chicks, 15 chicks a year, but they don't live as long. So the reproductive potential of saving one bird uh, makes a big difference, it can make a huge difference for the population. So another threat um, that we're finding with, with uh, related to climate change, we think, is um, this is some preliminary analysis I did last fall looking at our roughly 20 years of data on the productivity. Now that red line there is 0.48, which is how many chicks fledge per territorial pair. And that is supposed to be the number um, that where you have a population that's stable. Above that line, the population's growing. Below that line, the population's decreasing or has, will be decreasing over time. It's not producing enough chicks to maintain the population. So now granted, the, in the early years of the study, we didn't have a lot of birds that we were looking at. And um, so the, the earlier data may not be as accurate as the later data, where we now are looking at about 100 lakes in the park and that we're monitoring every year. And so, but you can see that there is definitely a downward trend in this, where they are not, they're, the number of chicks they're producing year after year is decreasing. And we think that is, um, and that's the number of chicks that are surviving to fledging age. So we think this is related to the nest failures. Um, the number of nest failures, or the percent of uh, nests that failed, has been increasing over time uh, from roughly around 40% to over 50% now. And what we've also been seeing in, in recent years are these huge torrential rain events. Um, this is 2015 here, June 23rd. That year, the loons came in, they, they start nesting usually in late May, early June. And uh, so about 26 to 28 days later, they're ready to hatch. Um, and that year, we had over 10 inches of rain in a three-week time period, including on the 23rd of, of June, we had over an inch and a half. And that flooded out a numerous nest that, that year. Um, this past summer, we had so much rain at the beginning of the summer that loons didn't nest until late. And so a lot of birds um, are usually hatching chicks sometime in, in the third week of June to early July. This year they were hatching chicks a month later, the third week of July through early August. And I had numerous calls and emails in the fall worried about, from people worried about if those chicks are going to survive or not, if they're going to be able to take off in time. And here's an example of one of our study lakes. Um, you can see in 1998 uh, or so, the precipitation is around 10, 12 inches a year. And then you get over to 2018, and it's over 15. So the amount of rainfall we're getting on these study lakes is, is significantly higher than it used to be. And so the, we looked at the percent of the causes of nest failure and predation is definitely a growing factor. We're seeing more eagles um, predating eggs. And we, a couple summers ago, we had bears predating eggs. We place out nest cameras now, and we've been able to document this. And, uh, but we're also seeing a huge number of, oops, sorry, backwards, of uh, nests that are failing, increasing number due to precipitation. And you can see this is what a nest looks like. This was uh, the, uh, one of the nests in 2015 that flooded overnight. And <coughs> we did a, a study, um, an analysis of this data, a publication in, came out in ecotoxicology this fall. Um, and you can see that the, the female loons, uh, their hatching success decreases as the uh, rainfall increases. So. And then um, the final, one of the other things that we're very concerned about, I don't have data on this yet, but is uh, the increased exposure to diseases. Um, there's a lot of vector-borne diseases that are increasing because of increasing temperatures. And um, one thing that we've seen in the Northeast is an, incident, an increasing incidence of avian malaria. It's a blood parasite, 
and in um, New Hampshire, it was documented that, that one of their birds actually passed away due to this blood parasite, it became really anemic. We have documented its presence in Adirondack loons, but we have not seen any symptoms yet. And we have an ongoing health study looking at um, the, how their health might change over time. And so with this, I'd just like to acknowledge some of our partners um, with the Vermont Loon, uh, Loon Conservation Project and the Loon Preservation Committee in New Hampshire, DEC. And we've had numerous people all throughout the Adirondack Park help us with our studies um, and many different organizations. And our work is supported through a lot of uh, funding through grants and donations, and, and we would not be able to do this work without that, and I'm very grateful to all the people that, that help support our work. We also have a lot of in-kind support from many organizations and landowners in the park. And with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions. So. The little, little clear, that's the little clear pond. Um, oh, okay. It's a specific pond, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I just use that as an example. In so. the back of the room? Yep. Yes, they actually um, were one of the five partners initially when we had the Adirondack um, cooperative loon program, and then we we do different projects with them on occasion. So. I I work with Leah separately on on several other projects. Yep. Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't like to sleep. <laughs> no, um, loons uh, loons are very hard to catch during the day. Um, unless they're sick or they're beaching themselves. Uh, loons, so I'm sure you guys know what jacking deer is, right? Um, we're known as the loon jackers in the park. <laughs> we have special permits from DEC and Fish and Wildlife Service to go do this work uh, where we have three people in a boat. We have a lighter, a netter, and a, and a boat driver. And we are using calls to call the birds in. Uh, we use the chick call. <laughs> to call in the adults, and we use the hoot, hoo, hoo, to call in the chicks, and they'll get this close to the boat. And then I can scoop them out of the water with a net, if we're lucky. <laughs> they don't always cooperate. But that's how we catch um, the loons for the banding and sampling field work. And ideally for any birds that are caught in fishing line and so on. Uh, unfortunately, if they don't have chicks, they can be very hard to catch. So. Um, I think on Butterfield Lake this summer, there was one that, that didn't have chicks and got caught in fishing line. And uh, there are sometimes we go out numerous times to try and catch a, a fishing line bird and we're unsuccessful. But other times, well, like that, that one that had the, uh, the lure on its wing, it, it just wasn't going to let us catch it. We figured out the light after the first night, the first time it saw the light. And every time we went out after that, we never saw it with the light. Um, but... The parade is, is on the 8th. Tonight is the fireworks. <laughs> so there's another question right yep. there. Go ahead. Uh, just a question about the nesting sites. Is it possible to do artificial like floating boxes or something like that? Similar to what we do in terms? Right, exactly. So um, that has is a management tool that is used frequently. It has, it has been used extensively in Vermont and New Hampshire um, and in Massachusetts. In New York, up until recently, again, this is all preliminary data. I need to go through it another time and QC it, QAQC it. But um, it may be something that we start using more in New York. There are people that put them out, but they're also a navigation hazard. So I need to work with DEC on, on that, uh, you know, if they need permits for that. So we should have more of that figured out by summer. Um, but at this point, we don't have the staff capacity to do something like that, but we could work with lake associations. And if our guidelines for putting a nest raft out are if a nest is flooded for so many years in a row um, or left high and dry for so many years, depends on, it used to be 
water level fluctuation with like dam controlled lakes, um, like some along the Oswegatchie River. But uh, in recent years, with the torrential rain events, you know, the natural rain precipitation is, is becoming more and more of a problem. So if they aren't successfully hatching chicks after three to five years due to water level fluctuations, then I might recommend a nest raft. So, and we have guidelines for that and all that. Go ahead. Probably. Where did you see that? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So in Lakes on Erie and Ontario, since about 1999, there have been outbreaks of botulism type E, which have been related to two invasive species, the quagga mussels and the round gobies. And the bacteria proliferates in the quagga mussels and the gobies eat the mussels and get sick with the toxin from Clostridium botulinum. And then migrating birds coming through, this is, happens in the fall when the water turns over and there's the anaerobic and the temperature conditions are correct. And then the, the bacteria can proliferate. And um, then the migrating fishing birds come through and they see these fish that are easy to catch and they end up dying. So there have been years when thousands of loons and thousands and thousands of long-tailed ducks and so on have been found dead along the shorelines. Um, Probably not, but that, you know, in that particular case, it may, may have been, you know, the outbreak in, there have been some botulism birds on Lake Ontario this year, but it's pretty late in the season for that, so I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions? Over here. Um, well, in the park, we haven't been seeing any impacts from the, the swans. The eagles, you know, their population has substantially increased uh, since DDT was banned, and, and they were reintroduced into the park in New York State. And, I mean, it's really cool to see eagles now, where 20, 30 years ago we didn't. Um, and they are definitely having an impact on the loons, but, but the loon population is impacted, has increased too, so that is probably a natural balance where the predation would keep the population from overgrowing. And, and I think, personally, that I think we're probably close to carrying capacity with loons right now where every territory is pretty much taken. Loons have been coming in and, and adding territories to lakes and, and um, inhabiting lakes where they haven't been there for 10, 15 years. And so I think if they didn't have a natural predator, um, we would be seeing more and more loon-loon uh, interactions and fighting and so on. Um, we are starting to see that, which we didn't see five years ago. Um, but, you know, with the other issues that we're seeing now, with such as the climate change, um, the loons may not be able to compensate for the natural predation. So, and the swans, I don't know yet. The loons are pretty aggressive with other animals. I have seen male loons chase a whole flock of geese up on the shore, um, you know, and, and they are really aggressive with each other when they're fighting. They will attack each other underwater and stab each other. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. And the, uh, when you look at the necropsies of the birds, there are holes in their sternums, and some of the birds die from being attacked by other loons. Thank you, Nita. I, one, I want to plug your annual census, too. Oh, yes. Because one thing, uh, every July it seems to be the same day as the Alexandria Bay Wooden Boat Show. It's the third Saturday in July. Yeah, there is a, <laughs> a loon census up here, which is coordinated through Tilt's office. And it's a great way to get involved in the loons and the loon research. So. Mm -hmm. I really encourage anybody who wants to to find out about that. Yep, and we want, we want as much information across New York as possible. So even if you don't live 
in this area, you don't live in the Adirondacks, if you live somewhere else in New York State or Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire also do it, Massachusetts, I think, too. So always on the third Saturday, July, in the morning. So, yeah. Thank you very much. So, so we'll come back from break at uh, 2.45.